Welcome to the story of the Royal Berkshire Hospital. Together with some of my colleagues and now fellow volunteers at our medical museum here, we're going to take you on a short journey through the history of the Royal Berkshire Hospital. And now I'd like to introduce you to two of my wonderful colleagues who are going to be helping me find out more about the history of this hospital. I'm Betty Messer and I was here for 42 years. I trained at this hospital and I worked here in several guises, lots of paediatrics and I was also a qualified teacher of nurses. My name is Tim Smith. I was consultant anaesthetist here for 25 years. On May the 27th, 1839, the hospital opened its doors. The first patient that was admitted was a young man called George Early. He was 15 years old and had a badly injured arm in a railway accident. He had an operation where he had his arm amputated at the shoulder. It was a miracle, but he survived and he left the hospital in July. The first seven or eight years of the hospital's existence was in the pre-anaesthetic era. Not many operations were performed. The major ones were amputation and cutting for the bladder stone. And then in 1847, anaesthesia was used for the first time, which was a momentous occasion. The next significant advance was in 1867 with the Lister's antiseptic spray. And those two things, anaesthesia and antisepsis, made the whole future development of surgery possible. In May 1862, both the east and the west wings were added. By 1874, a separate ward for children was established in the west wing. I'm standing here in the Englefield Garden, which is one of the latest projects here to be funded from the generosity of charitable contributions, the Benyon family. Charitable giving goes back here to the 16th of July, 1887, when the very first Hospital Sunday took place. And these continued until 1899, when the Hospital Appeal was formed. And this wonderful tradition continues to the present day, when the League of Friends and the Royal Barks Charity raise huge amounts of money, which plays the most crucial part in the running of the Trust today. In the early 1900s, we start to see the beginnings of specialisation, something we now take for granted. In 1904, surgeons were appointed to ENT and to ophthalmology. And in 1913, the first pathology laboratory was opened. At the same time as all these surgical advances, children were given a new home here on King Edward VII Ward. And these wonderful tiles was specially commissioned to brighten the walls. When World War I broke out, the Royal Berkshire Hospital was one of six war hospitals that were allocated military beds. They were allocated 50 beds, which was 25%. In addition to this, there was a huge meningitis outbreak, which meant that they needed many more beds for the patients to be nursed in. And they opened up a tented village in the garden. It wasn't only the doctors that specialised, it was the nurses and they also increased in number and it was felt that it was needed somewhere for them to stay. So the nurses' home was built on this site which is now the multi-storey car park. In 1931, one of our most famous patients, Douglas Bader, benefited from the operating theatres that had been recently opened, only three years earlier. His life is depicted in the film Reach for the Sky. Bada crashed at Woodley Aerodrome and was brought to the hospital in a pretty dreadful state and was taken straight to theatre. His life was saved by Leonard Joyce, who unfortunately had to amputate both legs. Bada went on to become a famous fighter ace and squadron leader in the Second World War. One of the most generous donations the hospital has received was from Lord Nuffield, who founded the Morris Car Company. 
1937, he gave this hospital £30,000, which was the cost of building the new Nuffield block, which had in it new gynaecology wards and also wards for children. And I'm speaking to you now from an iron lung, one of many produced to assist patients with polio. This one was made in the Morris Carr factory in Oxford and was given to the hospital by Lord Nuffield in 1939. The hospital celebrated its first 100 years in 1939. To mark the centenary, the hospital was also awarded its coat of arms. We're now going to take a giant leap to the 1960s. It was the decade which saw the eye and maternity blocks built and the opening of the Nurse Education Centre. The 1960s also saw medical photography established as a specialist field and as a service both in the NHS and here at the Royal Berkshire Hospital. The department is still going strong and they're also making this film. The 1970s were also a time of enormous social change. Medical advances also continued apace. At the RBH, these included the opening of the first intensive care unit in 1971. One of our first patients was Detective Constable Ian Coward, who had been shot while trying to arrest a criminal. He was treated for several weeks in the intensive care unit, but sadly died of his injuries. He was awarded the Queen's Medal for Gallantry posthumously. Harold Hopkins, Professor Hopkins, was Professor of Optical Physics here at Reading University, having come down from Imperial College in London. His was the genius that designed the telescopes that paved the way for minimally invasive surgery. Minimally invasive surgery is the term which most people will understand by the word keyhole surgery. It allows access into all parts of the body to carry out complex surgical operations. We rate this evolution of the telescope as being on a par with antiseptic surgery and with general anaesthesia as demonstrated by Morton. The role of the Royal Berkshire Hospital was that one of our surgeons, Mr. Conrad Latto, a distinguished urologist and general surgeon, trialled some of these telescopes here at the Royal Berkshire in his work as a urologist, using them to look at detail in the bladder and at bladder cancer. One of the values of the Royal Berkshire Hospital is to be aspirational. And this is as true today as in the past. The 1970s saw the opening of the new postgraduate medical education centre, now familiarly known as Tech, where a vast amount of teaching has been delivered in order to continue to provide outstanding care for our patients. Another area where aspiration was really brought to life was by consultant anaesthetist Marshall Barr. Well, I was a trainee anaesthetist at the Royal Berkshire Hospital in the early 1980s. And at that time, the hours that you worked a week were between about 80 and 100, and that involved a one in four weekend on call. And it was extremely difficult to try and combine that with having children. Fortunately for me, I was in the right place at the right time, being at the Royal Berkshire Hospital, because Marshall Barr, who was the educational supervisor at that point, was an avid proponent of the part-time married women's doctor scheme, and he persuaded me to apply for that. And that allowed you to work half the number of hours a week for twice as many years. But that meant I could actually finish my training and combine that with having a family. And if, if I hadn't done that, I would never have been a consultant. So we leave the 1970s and enter the 1980s, a decade which showed enormous changes in national healthcare policy. Here at the RBH, the modern day path lab was opened. In 1980, the Ken Thomas appeal raised one and a quarter million pounds. The A&E unit moved from Battle Hospital to the RBH. And in 1989, we celebrated our 150th anniversary, which was marked by a visit from Her Majesty the Queen. With the Copeland shoulder and laryngeal mask for anaesthetics, to name just two of the many major developments by teams here at the Royal Berkshire Hospital, our legacy is always 
one of innovation and change. We will always look ahead to the challenges of the future and the health and well-being of the people we serve, while embracing our role as an iconic part of the local community since 1839. So here we are today and our story will continue. Perhaps some of you would like to join us in the Medical Museum to help pass on the legacy of the Royal Berkshire Hospital into the future.